Welcome to Living Word Ministries with our director and Bible teacher, Debbie Blank. Study with us verse by verse to hear and heed his book, along with other topics of Bible prophecy. Let's pray. Father God, it's such a joy to be together with like-minded people who choose to be here to study your word, to know you better, to know your plans for the future. This, this is an optional study, and as Mary and I were talking, we're pretty tired at night. We're pretty worn out, especially as we get older. We want to go to bed early, and yet each one of us has chosen to be here to study your word. I pray, Father, that your word will not return void without accomplishing its purpose in our lives and preparing us for what the future holds. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you that I heard this week, uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, about the potential vax pass that the president is talking about initiating. Now, right now in Israel, they have a green pass, which means you cannot go into a movie theater or a restaurant or a hotel without the, the green pass showing you've either had COVID or you've had the vaccine. And I thought, oh boy, I'm glad they're We've got time before we're supposed to go to Israel because, you know, I, I wouldn't like that. I don't like the government taking away my freedoms. Uh, you know, get the shot or not get the shot, I just don't like that happening. So when I heard that yesterday, I found myself going, oh. And I, my husband and I, when we were going out last night, I said, well, you know, I heard this today, and what are we going to do if, and what are we going to do if, and what are we going to do if? Finally he said, you know, I don't like to speculate in hypotheticals. I don't even want to think about it. I don't want to talk about it because we don't know if it's going to happen. We're just going to wait and see. That's not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> now, fortunately, we were going out to dinner with some friends because I brought it up to the friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I didn't have time to just go to God and say, okay, God, give me the answer. We were with people, him first and then people. And plus, I, I just, I wanted some reassurance. So as we were talking about different things, and, and this guy was just calm as a cucumber, because that's the kind of guy he is. Just calm as can be. And you know, he says basically the same thing. I can't do anything about it. We'll wait and see what happens, and yada, yada. But then he said something that really struck me. And that was, um, well, uh, you know, when I said, but what if we can't eat? He said, well, we can have food delivered. And you know, it was just a simple thing like that. And all of a sudden, I thought, Oh, yeah. Why am I even worried? Why do I get concerned? Because whatever the situation is, and no matter how bad it gets in any situation, and no matter how bad it is here, God is always in control, and he always has a plan. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have a farm that we can go off to, and a few of you in here do, uh, you know, a place that we can go, if, that, if it comes to that, it certainly won't come to that if you have the vaccine, but for the others or in the tribulation period, if we don't have a place like that, we don't have anything we can do except trust the Lord. And that's what it's all about. There are moments in this world today where we're going to get anxious. We're going to hear something like that, and, and all of a sudden it's going to stir up, and we're going to go, but what if, and what am I going to, and that kind of stuff. Don't worry about it. Go to God. In my case, I went to a friend. I mean, a friend told me, but had he, had he not said something that struck me, uh, by the time I had gone to bed that t last night, I would have been praying about it, and I know God would have comforted me on that. But he is our comfort. He is our strength. He is in control. Well, I also preface that because when I left class last week, I, I had told you, because we had just talked about it in Revelation 13, that, that Satan's in control now. He's in control of the world. And the fact of the matter is, when sin came into the world, he is the God of this world. And God has given him authority in this world, but it's God who's given him the authority. Satan, anything he does or has, he only has it because God has allowed it for him. So I want to take you back to Revelation 11, verses 15 to 17, where it tells us a little bit about that there. It says, when the seventh trumpet sounded, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Now, this is a hope this is the wisdom that God gave us before he showed us what's going to happen with Satan and the Antichrist. Because he wanted us to remember that he is in control. He has won. Now it's going to be three and a half years from this time period until he wins, but he has won the victory. It goes on to say, 
And the 24 elders who sit on the thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who, who, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Now, th I just want to remind you, they've begun to reign at this time when Satan is in power and the Antichrist, and they're both throwing out their evil to the entire word, which is going to be horrible. But Jesus has begun to reign. He's in control. He's on his throne up in heaven. He's in control of everything that happens on this earth. As a matter of fact, nothing could happen that he doesn't allow. And we see that in Job chapter 1. I mentioned it last week, but I want to take you there now so you can see that the only power that Satan has, God allows him to have. In Job chapter 1, it talks about how, uh, in verse 6, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. So God allows Satan once in a while to come into his kingdom, to come into his area. Now, that's not the eternal heaven that we're talking about. We're talking about here with God and the angels. And um, he said to Satan in verse 8, Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. And J Satan says, Does Job fear God for nothing? So he's intim trying to intimidate God. So he said, You put a hedge of protection around him. So God said, You can put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. Oh, or Satan said that. And you do that, God, and he's going to curse you. So God said in verse 12, The Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. Now did you catch that? God had his hands of protection around Job. And he allowed his hand to be taken away so that Satan could work in Job's life for a period of time. If you read the whole story and you get to chapter 42, you'll find out that blameless Job had some issues that, you know, he just needed to, be, needed to be skimmed off the top in his life. Just like we all do when we think we're righteous before God, we have some issues. The point here being that Satan has absolutely no power that God hasn't allowed him to have. Remember that. With all that's going to happen from now on and all that happens all the time, God is sovereign. S-O-V-E. R-E-I-G-N. That means God reigns over all. And he's in charge even at this time. And he's won. And he's got this whole three and a half years laid out. And it's going to be so much worse than anybody could ever imagine. But God has won and he has allowed it to happen for this period of time. Make sense? I don't know if it makes sense. But that's what, that's what it says. Well, we have today come to where we are here on this chart. Everything that's on here, we have found in the three passages that are up in the top left. Nothing that I put there, it's all in the Word of God that lays out what's going to happen in the end times. Today, we're not going to really continue on that chart as much as we are. We're going to dig through chapter 13 of Revelation and find out all that we learn there. So, uh, um... Before we do, I want to go back into Revelation 13. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm just going to give you the snippets of what we learned about the beast. He's called the beast here, but in a minute we'll see that we call him the Antichrist. It says, I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. We discussed that last week. We had a chart last week of who these... Uh, seven heads and ten horns represent out of Revelation 17. He came up out of the sea, so he's coming up out of the Gentile nations. And when you think of the sea, too, by the way, if, if for those of you who've ever been on the sea on rough waters, what's, what's it like when you're traveling out in the ocean? Not just a nice calm lake or river, but what's, what are the waters like? Oh, choppy and dangerous. Oh. And they can be very dangerous. And what? Foamy, yeah. So th there's a lot of chaos that goes on in the waters on a choppy day. And this is where the Antichrist is coming up out of that chaos, out of the world. It tells us, uh, it says, And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. We determined earlier who the dragon was, and that is Satan, Satan gives him his authority. 
I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. Some people think that's a former government that now is coming to life again, and we'll talk about that later. Some people think it's an actual resurrection example. He does not have, Satan does not have the power to resurrect from the dead. At least nothing that we see in scripture says he does, only God does. So it would have to be an act that appears to be a resurrection. And by the way, next week we'll talk about that. How many similarities there are, well, I should say contrasts, there are between God and Satan during this time of tribulation. How Satan is always trying to mimic God. So it wouldn't surprise me if that was a resurrection. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshipped the beast. They were given, it was, there was given to him mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemes and authority to act for how long? 42 months. That's the last half of the tribulation. This guy's in charge. It's called a beast here, but we call him the Antichrist. Going to be hell on earth. Let's, we're going to continue and talk about other names that are used for the Antichrist in Scripture. Uh, the word Antichrist comes from these three passages, which gives us the understanding of what he's like, what his attitude is, his belief is, but it doesn't mention that there is a person named the Antichrist. There's just the spirit of Antichrist. Uh, it says, who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. Every spirit that doesn't confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. And then in 2 John 7, it says, For many deceivers have gone out of the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus is coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the Antichrist. So with that idea, what is an Antichrist? Okay, somebody who's not only not a believer, but who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ at all, at, but certainly as God, thus denies the Father and the Son. I mean, there's a lot of people that are not believers that believe in the Father and the Son. Mm -hmm. They go to a lot of Christian churches, religious churches, and they're trained in that, but they've com not committed their lives to Jesus. So this is an, uh, a deception. This is a turning away, an op opposition, a blaspheming of God is the spirit of Antichrist. That's where somebody, many hundreds of years ago, named this person, this beast in Revelation 16, 13, as the Antichrist. But if you look up Antichrist in Scripture, you will not see him. Instead, you're going to see him called the prince who is to come. We read this in Daniel chapter 9, when it says, the people of the prince who is to come. So that gives him the title, the prince who is to come. We'll destroy the city and the sanctuary, and we know that happened in 70 AD, and who did it? Who destroyed the city and the sanctuary? The Romans. Now, the next one tells us about the Antichrist, this prince who is to come. He's go be going to be the one that starts the tribulation by making a firm covenant with the many, so a, a forced covenant with the Jews for one week, which is seven years. But in the middle of the week, what's he going to do? Okay, um, he's going to put a stop to sacrifices and grain offerings, and on the wing of abomination will come one who makes desolate. So those are a lot of words thrown in there, but right in the middle of the tribulation period, three and a half years in, he's going to do the abomination of desolation. In other words, he's going to go into the temple and declare himself God. And it says it right here, gives us the timing of it right here. This is the timing, the foundation that gave us the seven years of the tribulation in this passage. So he's called the prince who is to come. He's also called the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, and also the lawless one in 2 Thessalonians. We haven't really read this whole passage, so we're going to read it tonight. The context here in 2 Thessalonians 2 is the people were worried in Thessaloniki because some people were telling them that Jesus had already come and they missed it. And so Paul is reassuring him that the coming of Jesus has not yet happened. So he says in verse 3, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it, that's the coming of Jesus, will not come unless apostasy comes first. That's the falling away. Are we seeing that in this nation, in this world today? Yeah, yeah tremendously. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So what is it like to have lawlessness and destruction? Chaos. Yeah. Chaos. Lawlessness. I mean, we're seeing lawlessness now in Portland. Complete lawlessness, what's happening with other people. This is going to be 
the man of lawlessness. He's going to promote lawlessness all over the globe. And it says of him also, he's the son of destruction. So not just lawlessness, but destruction. And it used to be rioting that we'd see periodically when something happened and we'd see that destruction and chaos. Now it's ongoing and nobody's stopping it. It says, it goes on to say, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God and object of worship. So he's going to put himself above Yahweh, above Jesus, above Allah, above Hindu gods and, and Buddhist gods, everybody. And then it says, so he takes his seat in the temple of God and displays himself as being God. That's the abomination of desolation. Happens right in the middle of the tribulation period. He goes into the temple, which tells us there's going to be a temple, and he de declares that he is God. Wow. What do you think the Jews are going to do when somebody goes into their temple and does that? Uh, it's not going to be a pretty sight because they will be forced either to accept him as God or to fight against him because he claims to be God. Verse 5 says, Do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains him will do so until he's taken out of the way. So the mystery of lawlessness is, is going on now. But there's something's going to happen. The restrainer is going to be taken out of the way. And then this whole lawlessness, this whole chaos, this whole attitude of destruction is going to be seen by everyone. What's really sad is they're going to worship him for it. But it's going to be seen by everyone. So who is the restrainer? The Holy, the Holy Spirit. And so when people read this, because we're talking about the abomination of desolation taking place in the middle of the tribulation, and they see that that's when the restrainer is taken out of the way, at least it looks like it in this passage, they'll say that the rapture of the church happens in the middle of the tribulation, right before the abomination of desolation. But that's not what this says. What it says is he's not going to be revealed for all of his destruction and his chaos until the church is gone. But that doesn't mean it has to be in the middle of the tribulation. It could be at the beginning of the tribulation. It's just in the middle of that the abomination of desolation takes place. So yes, the, there's many options of who the restrainer is, but quite frankly, I've read them all. I've read everybody's belief systems and what they are. Nothing makes sense except the Holy Spirit. So imagine. First of all, what does that tell you about the church? We have to be gone. Because the Holy Spirit resides inside of us. So the church has to be gone by this time, whatever time that it's talking about here. And then, what do we know about the Holy Spirit? How does he work in the world today? Yeah, he convicts people. He's designed to draw people to Jesus Christ and to convict them of their sins. He's going to be gone. This is going to be a different paradigm shift. If you believe in dispensationalism, this is a whole different dispensational time. It's not going to be like the church age, the age of grace that we're in now. It's not going to be that people just can hear and the Holy Spirit's at work and, 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 and convicts us and we get saved and everything's awesome with the Lord. It's a different dispensation. In the Old Testament, did the Holy Spirit indwell people? No. no. Instead, the Holy Spirit came upon people for a period of time for God's work, and then left. Now, during the church age, the age of grace, the Holy Spirit indwells us. But it's going to be different in the tribulation. What? I don't know. How's it going to look? I don't know. But this says clearly that the restrainer is going to be taken out of the way. So he holds evil back, and he's going to be gone. So what does that tell you about the forces of evil? They'll be unruly. They'll be lawless. They'll be everywhere. Chaos. So now it calls him the lawless one as we go on in verse 8. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. I see, this is another time frame. If you look at this and think that the, this is all happening in the middle of the tribulation, well, it's not. Because the same passage says the lawlessness one is going to be revealed and God's going to slay him. Well, God's going to slay him at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. 
not in the middle or not when he's revealed. So this is a kind of an overview of the Antichrist here, not specifically time sequences. But what kind of hope does that give us when we read that? Blessed hope. That's right. He wins. He's going to he's going to be victorious over Satan and over the Antichrist because he's going to slay them when he comes. Verse nine then says that is the one who's coming is in accord with the activity of Satan. You got to be careful here because it's just talking about the Lord's coming, and then it starts going back to the Antichrist. So it's changing on us a little bit, and we cannot think that the Lord's coming is any activity of Satan. But the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders, that's the lawless one. And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of truth so as to be saved. Big word in here, deception. Deception of wickedness. I, I've always known since I started studying prophecy how much of an emphasis Jesus makes in Matthew 24 on the last days when he says, do not be deceived. Be careful that you're not deceived. I, it's going to be so bad even the elect could be deceived. And I know he emphasized that, but it's just hitting me more and more these days about how deceived we are. We are deceived. Well, first of all, people at that time are going to be deceived because the devil is a liar. He's the father of lies, and so Satan and the Antichrist are just going to be nothing but liars and deceivers. But also we're seeing it in our culture today. We're seeing manipulation. We're seeing intimidation. We're seeing cancel culture so that we only have one view that's put out there. We're seeing the deception. Now, some of it may be right, but the fact of the matter is a lot of it's not from any side. Yeah, I'm glad you went back and pointed that out because that's a very important part of it. Uh, it goes back here in verse 10, and it says, With all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. And that means that people have chosen not to follow Jesus. They didn't receive the love of the truth, so God sends them a deluding influence. They have chosen not to walk with Jesus. It's their decision so he, he blinds their eyes to the truth and they see this deception and believe it's true. How many of your friends do you totally disagree with on stuff and you are solid in what you believe and so are they? So who's right and who's wrong? Well, it says here, if they haven't received the love of the truth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Grace says she is. And I, I think most of us in this room would say, well, I'm right, but... Um, but they haven't received the love of the truth, so God allows them to have a deluding influence. You can read Romans chapter 1. Several times in there, it says the same thing. God will send them a deluding influence. When they choose to turn away from God, God says, I've, I've done everything I can. My grace only goes so far, but when you choose, and I'm putting horrible words into God's mouth because he wouldn't say it this way, but the idea is God does everything he can to draw us to him. The Holy Spirit does everything he can. But if we're not going to do that then God will just say, okay, I can't do anything more. And he sends them a deluding influence, and that's what's going to happen. But it's only going to happen because they turned away from Jesus. They didn't turn to Jesus. It's not going to happen because God's punishing them or hurting them. They have made their decision. Yeah. Oh, that's so important because what she's saying is, or what she's asking kind of saying is that it doesn't matter where you are in your walk with the Lord. We've got to start somewhere. So we have some that are just new believers and we have some that have been studying for decades. But that's not what's important. What's important is our walk with the Lord. It's our hearts. It's the Holy Spirit residing in us because the Holy Spirit is our teacher and he will teach us and he will show us what to do unless we've squeezed that conduit, unless we've squelched the spirit. He's still there, but we may kind of crush him sometimes because we take over matters on our own. But even when we do, he's always there to try and bring us back to himself. Always. And when we need any help, he's always there to give us the answer. I will tell you, I have found in scripture that if my life's in turmoil, if something's wrong, or even if it's a little thing like yesterday, it was so hurtful to me, so painful to me, if I will just wait three days, mm -hmm. if I will pray and seek God's direction and just wait three days, it'll all be better. Now, that doesn't mean the problem will be solved. 
That doesn't mean I'll have the answer. But what it means is I've spent three days seeking the Lord and my heart's totally different because of him. And where do I get that? Where do I get the three days? Three days. Jesus was in the ground three days. Jonah was in the whale three days. Um, I think it was Hezekiah that was sick for three days. So there's, there's scripture. And, and so I, I saw that one time and just thought, you know what, God? No matter how bad things are, I'm just going to trust you. And it's amazing. The third day I will wake up and it'll just, I'll just have a whole different attitude because God will have worked in my heart. And then he'll take care of whatever the situation is one way or another, not always the way we want it to be. So this is what it's going to be. Let's finish up this passage in, in about the lawlessness. It says, for, um, for this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. So God's going to give them a delusion, delusion and they're going to believe all of this falsehood. Why do you think the whole world's going to worship the Antichrist and dra- the dragon? Because they've already turned away. F- I see the whole world, not the whole world, but many people. Because they've already turned away from God and God gives them a deluding influence. Okay, the king. He is called the king in Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11, if you try and study it, go to my website and watch our video on Daniel 11 because it is very confusing. The king of the north and the king of the south and then the antichrist. and You just need a cheat sheet to be able to study that passage. But in this passage, it's specifically talking about the antichrist and he's called a king. Then the king will do as he pleases. And he will exalt himself and magnify himself about every god and will speak monstrous things against the god of gods. Does that sound ex- exactly like what we've been seeing? Yeah. yeah. It, scripture complements each other. This is a different book saying the same thing. And he will prosper until the indignation is finished for that which is decreed will be done. So he's going to prosper for seven years. Maybe before that, but not as the Antichrist. Until the indignation is done, until he's complete, until God takes care of him. Verse 37, he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers. So that means that his forefathers, whatever they followed, whether it was Islam or Christianity or Judaism, whatever it was, although I believe he's a Gentile, uh, he does not follow the gods of his fathers. And it also says he also does what? He has no desire for? Women, you know, a lot of preachers for a long time and a lot of books kind of um, came up with a lot of reasons of what that meant because homosexuality was not only a sin, but it was punishable by imprisonment. Well, now we can understand how most countries in the world support homosexuality. And we're going to see tonight that one of the sustainable development goals is accepting people for whatever they believe. So the desires of women, it, it's not going to be unusual. It isn't unusual now. Nor will he show regard for any other God. So he's not only going to not follow his God of his fathers, but he's not going to follow our God or any other God that there is in the world. For he will magnify himself above them all. But instead, he will honor a God of fortresses. What does that tell you? Wealth, what? Military Military power, force, all of that, power. A God whom his fathers did not know. Interesting, so his fathers, whoever they were, were more peacemakers than they were forceful. He will honor him with gold and silver and costly stones and treasures. He's going to put a lot of money into this God that he's following of fortresses. He will take action against the strongest of fortresses with the help of a foreign god. Mm, New god? Aliens, maybe? We've talked about that before in this class, how that's becoming so big. We could have an alien god that he's following. He will give great honor to those who acknowledge him and cause them to rule over the many and will parcel out land for a price. We saw a little bit of that, but in Revelation 17, He has 10 kings that he gives part of the kingdom to. Parcels out land for a price. He's going to be a nice guy? He's going to be a good ruler caring about the people? No. Now he's called the beast again in Revelation 17, and this gives us an idea of him controlling 
uh, the country, the world, and the kings. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. Uh, that's a little hard to understand, but the idea is either it's dealing with him and his resurrection or it's dealing with his kingdom that he runs, that the Roman Empire, for example, that was and is not now, but it's going to re regurgitate itself into power in the last days. It will resurrect itself. And it, but it's going to be destroyed or he's going to be destroyed. And those who dwell on the earth, whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, and I told you we'll talk about that as we get there later, will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. Mm. So they're going to wonder about this. So it could be his resurrection or uh, his seeming resurrection. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains in which the woman sits. We talked about this last week. And they have seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and one is yet to come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. Scholars will tell us that what we're talking about here are world kingdoms because this Antichrist is going to be in control. He's going to run. He's going to be president of a world kingdom. Five have fallen. What are the five world powers, especially dealing with Israel, because this is all about Israel? Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, five have fallen. One is. What's the one that is at the time of John? Rome. And one is yet to come. And what's the one that's yet to come? The world kingdom of the Antichrist. That's the one yet to come. Verse 11, the beast which was and is not, is himself an eighth and is one of the seven and he goes to destruction. D have you seen the repetition here? Every time we talk about the Antichrist, he goes to destruction. He's going to be destroyed. As a matter of fact, he is going to be, and the false prophet are going to be the first two that are ever thrown into the eternal hell, the lake of fire. So they're not just going to destruction, but they're the first ones to enter hell. We see that in Revelation 19, and we'll see that later. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. So this is where the beast, the Antichrist, gives his authority to people. He parcels out land at a price. They have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. So this these ten kingdoms as we'll see in a little while, they're going to envelop the whole earth. They're going to give their power to the Antichrist. So he's not, um, so this is a government that he's, but a government that's going to be in place, but he is running it. He's going to be the president of the world. He's going to be the Roman emperor, so to speak. And nobody has power over him because Satan is indwelling, I empowering him and because he's, people worship him. Wow. Uh, now, let's talk about this global government because this tells us in several of the aspects that we saw that he is going to rule over a global government. In Revelation 13, 8, we read, it was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Pretty clear, he's going to be in charge. And we just read Revelation 17, 12, and 13 to say, He's going to be in charge of the whole world. But he can't do it by himself. He needs a government. So we, we see this one world government depicted in many places in Scripture, but the best place is Daniel 2. In Daniel 2, King Nebuchadnezzar, who was an evil, wicked man, had a dream. Daniel, who was a Jewish boy who was taken into captivity in Babylon, and he was made a going to be made into like a prince in Babylon. He was a prince in Israel, uh, but he's going to be made into an important person in Babylon. But he had a d the king had a dream, and the king was really smart. Instead of going to his conjurers and saying, tell me what my dream means, he went to them and said, tell me what my dream was, and then tell me what it means. Well, nobody can do that except, except God. Except God. So, you know what his consequence was? He's going to have every one of those people killed. Well, Daniel was one of those magicians or conjurers or whatever you wanted to call them in the realm. So Daniel was going to be killed. So he said to his handler, you know, 
buy me some time. Go to the king and, and just give me some time to pray about this. And he did, and God gave him the dream. Told him what the dream was. So he repeats the dream to the king. He says here in Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 2, verses 31 to 36, You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of the statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, and the legs of iron, his feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that there was not a trace of them to be found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Oh, that's quite a, that's quite a dream. So he's got the statue. And each part of the statue has a different meaning. Daniel now, once he told him what that dream was, he interprets the dream, tells him what it is. He says in verses 36 to 39, this was the dream. Now we will tell its interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the air, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. So first, first piece. Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold. After you, there will arise another kingdom inferior to you. Well, we know historically that's the Medo-Persians. They conquered the Babylonians. Then a third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over the earth. And that would be the Grecian kingdom. We know historically that those are the three kingdoms in order that conquered each other. We're told now that there's a fourth kingdom. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things. Now remember, the legs were of iron. It goes on to say, So like iron that breaks at pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. In that you saw the feet and the toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom, but it will have in it the toughness of iron inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. Let's stop here for a minute. What's the fourth kingdom? Historically, what was the fourth world kingdom that came on the scene? Rome. Rome. And it was a tough kingdom. When it says made of iron, it was the strongest of all the kingdoms. And it was the largest of all the kingdoms that are mentioned before. But after the kingdom of Rome, which were the legs, you have the feet and the toes. How many toes are there? Ten. Hmm. How many horns does the Antichrist have? Ten. Hmm, we're seeing a correlation here of ten. It goes on to say in verse 42, As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so some of the kingdom will be strong and some of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another even as iron does not combine with pottery. So this last kingdom on earth, which is what this is talking about, is going to come out of where? What, what do the feet come out of? The legs. And what kingdom is the legs? Are the legs? Rome. The Roman Empire. So that, keep that in your mind. We're going to see that in a little while too. So you have these toes that are partly of iron, partly of clay. What could that mean? Remember, Rome was strong of his iron. Well, keep that thought. We'll, we'll get to that when we see it in a minute when we look at a statue and we see a picture. Then there's this final kingdom that comes about that's the stone at the foot of the statue that Daniel had interpreted. In the days of those kings, what kings is he talking about? The ten kingdoms, the ten kings in this final world kingdom it says, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it itself will endure forever. Whose kingdom is this? 
Yeah, this is the kingdom of God. This is the return of Jesus Christ. This is the kingdom that will never be destroyed. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. We have in that passage, and you've got to read the whole passage just to kind of see what happened. But we see all the kingdoms in the world that are going to control Israel. But more importantly, all the kingdoms, not more importantly, but as importantly, all the kingdoms of the world that were world kingdoms. You didn't have, Egypt was not a world kingdom. It was a strong force. Assyria was a regional kingdom. But when you get to Babylon and you get to these others, at least from the time of the Babylonians, those are the world kingdoms. And since the time of Rome, when was Rome destroyed or when did Rome cease to be a power? 476 A.D. However, Rome never really dissolved. It kind of infiltrated itself into Europe. And they were, if you know the history, which I don't know it well, but you have all those times when they were fighting each other for control of that area that we know as Europe. So there were always kingdoms in there, little kingdoms, but you might say it just became really brittle because it was not a world power and each kingdom had temporary power but not world dominion. But there is going to arise a final world kingdom that will then be in control of the Jews but also be a world power. And from what we've read so far, does this kingdom look like it's going to be just a regional kingdom where Babylon was? Now, it's talked about the whole world in some of these passages, about the Antichrist and what he's going to rule over and the ten kingdoms. It's going to be the whole world. This is going to be a one-world government. That's how Daniel lays it out. Questions, comments? All right, well, if that's not confusing enough, <laughs> Daniel 7 then talks about a little horn, another name for the Antichrist. Here he's called the little horn. It's, I didn't give you the whole passage, and I'm not giving you chapter 8 of Daniel, which is prophetic also, uh, but I'm just giving you enough to help you understand that there's a final world kingdom coming, and it's prophesied in Daniel. It says here in Daniel 7, 7, After this I kept looking into the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast. Now, he had seen three beasts previously, but I didn't read you. He'd seen three beasts, and they represent... I believe, I'm going to tell you what I believe, and then I'm going to have Z share with you his thoughts because he's got a little different thoughts than I do about these kingdom. But um, it is said there were three beasts, and they really represent Babylon and Media persia and Greece. And then it says, I saw a fourth beast. This one is dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong. I just those words, dreadful, terrifying. I scared the Dickens out of Larry tonight when I came up and he wasn't expecting me. And he went like this. You know, we get startled. But how often do we get terrified? I mean, I don't know that I've ever been terrified. That's a strong word. Shows you what this kingdom is going to be like. It goes on to say, extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. Ah, its feet. Hmm. The feet of iron and clay that we just saw. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. Mm, seeing a correlation here. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little horn, came up among them. And three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, the horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. Well, we've seen the uttering great boasts, the blasphemies. This time it says that there are ten kingdoms and then there's this little horn that comes up and he takes out three kingdoms and puts himself into place because he's that powerful. It says he has eyes like what? Man. Like a man. So we're depicting a man here. It, even though it says like a man, which is a simile, it's talking about a man, not a beast. But when you talk about beasts, you're talking about really ferocious beings. So the idea of this kingdom, all these kingdoms are ferocious. So Daniel, of course, said, well, explain it to me because I don't understand what you're trying to tell me. 
He explains it, and I'm not sure we understand it, but at least we have a better picture. It says, These great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will arise from the earth. Thus he said, The fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. Is that just regional? It's the whole earth. Rome was regional, the Roman Empire. All the other were regional. This is worldwide. As for the ten horns, out of the kingdom, ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one. Blasphemies again against God and wear down the saints. Who are the saints? Believers. He's going to wear down the believers of the highest one. Could be talking about Jews, could be talking about Christians, but they're believers, whoever they are. And he will intend to make alterations in time and in law. And they will be given into his hand for times, times, and a half a time. So uh, they're going to begin, we've said before, how long is time, times, and half a time? Three and a half years. So all the people are going to be given into his hand for three and a half years. Before it says that, it says that he's going to try and make alterations in time and in law. How, how could that look? Can we imagine somebody coming in and saying, we're changing the Gregorian calendar and we're going to make it our own? What? Oh, no. Uh, we have the Islamic calendar. They follow their calendar based on when Muhammad fled Medina or Mecca. When he fled Me Mecca. They start a calendar there year then. And if you are familiar with Islam, it has its own laws. Sharia law. Right? You look at the Jews. The Jews have their own calendar. From what they say is the beginning of time. And the Jews have their own religious laws that they follow, as well as some secular laws that they follow. You look at China. China's got their own calendar. So it's not unusual to see. We can't necessarily say this is going to be a Jew or a Muslim, but it's not unusual for a leader or for a religion or a political entity to start over with a new timeline and new laws. Hmm, are we seeing a lot of new laws these days? I'm not, uh, believe me, I'm not saying Joe Biden is the Antichrist by any means. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying that what we can see is that things can change very quickly. Did we ever think a year ago that our country, our world would be where it is today? Could we have imagined this? Times change very quickly. Oh, we're going to get talking about that. He said the United States demands 80% of our trade paid in dollars. The dollar is the currency of world trade right now. That's going to change. Yep. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. So you get the idea. There's a final world kingdom that's coming. This is a, uh, for those of you who get the notes, you can look at this on your own. But this is a layout explaining, here's the statue, fuzzy as it is. That's what it boils down to. That's what it means in blue. And that's how chapter 7 matches up with chapter just to show you how closely they are aligned. Now, we talk about the Roman Empire. If you look at that map, you will see that in blue, you have the European Union. The European Union actually is 27 now, if you recall, not 28, Z, because England withdrew. So that's changed. They have 27 nations. They're in blue. That started first originally in 1957. And then in 2008, that wasn't enough because that was just the northern part of the Mediterranean. You needed to get the eastern and the southern part. So on, um, in 2008, 15 more partners were added to this union for the Mediterranean, it's called. So now you have the entire Mediterranean surrounded by two different unions, but two different unions that work very closely in alignment to one another. We, I put the first verse up here from Daniel 9.26 because if you go back and remember the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The people who destroyed the city and the sanctuary was Rome. So Rome are the people that the prince who is to come is going to come out of. It says it right there. 
So the Antichrist is going to come from the revived Roman Empire, from the area of the Roman Empire. That's a big area, isn't it? Now this is what it looks like today. That's the Roman Empire. Now if you put them on top of each other, they're almost identical. The Roman Empire, the, the new Mediterranean states go down a little bit further into North Africa and they go just, um, I don't think, they go a little farther east. No, they don't go quite as far. Yeah, they go a little further east over into the Middle East. But the point is what we're seeing right now with the establishment of the EU and the Mediterranean states, it's a coalition that's the same as the Roman Empire. So we have the formation ready to go for this world empire. Now, another thing, and this is really fascinating, is this was a chart that was on the United Nations website in 2009. In 1972, the United Nations came up with a plan. We call it today sustainable development, or they do, or <laughs> they, they call it a lot of things, but sustainable development is pretty much what it is. They came up with it in 1972. They've never put it into practice because they didn't have the power or the support to do it until now. But in 2009, their sustainable development plan divided the world into how many divisions? Ten, Ten divisions. This I took off of their website in 2009. It's not there anymore, but it was there then. They divided it into 10 units. And this is the goal. They have 17 goals. Uh, one of them, I meant gender equality number five. Remember, I just talked about that with the Antichrist. But you look at that, no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education. Those are laudable goals. These are world goals. What has to happen to put these laudable goals into place? You have to have support of the entire world. And you have to have redistribution of wealth. And you have to have the ability to bring these things about. And you say, well, that's the United Nations. Oh, yes, but everybody else is buying into it, including our country and including the Catholic Church and including Europe and including all the powers that be. It's taken since 1972, but they're all buying into it. This is the direction we're going. Now, the United Nations, you know, a lot of people thought the United Nations would be the final world government. Not necessarily. They used to be the League of Nations when they were founded. They became the United Nations. Uh, if this new Roman Empire I encompasses the whole world, they will just take the United Nations as one segment of them or one of the committees within them of this. So it doesn't have to be the United Nations. However, 193 of the 195 countries in the world are members of the United Nations. So it's a powerful entity. Now, you look at the presidential support that the idea of a global entity has. I have quotes from every president going back to the early 1900s supporting a global development. But let me just read you a few of them. George H.W. Bush said, the crisis of the Persian Gulf offers a rare opportunity to move toward an historic period of cooperation. Out of these troubled times, a new world order can emerge in which the nations of the world, east and west, north and south, can prosper and live in harmony. Today, the new world order is struggling to be born. Well, it was more than struggling at that point. It was, it was moving along. In a speech delivered in 2009, former President Barack Obama said, all nations must come together to build a stronger global regime. He was a brilliant spokesman, President Obama was. And his words were always, he spoke very carefully, not like President Trump. Um, and because of that, he may have said a world regime, but what he meant was one world government. He just did, he used different words. Joe Biden said, the affirmative task before us is to create a new world order. And this is great because David Rockefeller, who wasn't a president, but he was a banker, very wealthy, he said, we're on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. Do you think we have the right crisis? 
And not only do we have the right crisis, but now there's this question, okay, we get the vaccine. We're safe. Oh, no, we're not. We've got all these mutations. I've just read of three mutations just in the last day that have come forward, actually four that have come forward, uh, mutations. And, and will we be covered in the vaccine? Well, we're not sure. So we'll have to maybe shut down again because it's going to keep mutating or, or we're going to have to have another shot. And, you know, we have been really diligent, or most of, many of us have, in researching these vaccines. Now, they're not vaccines by legal definition, but researching these shots. We've been diligent about it. But are we going to be about the third shot? Or the fourth shot? Or the fifth shot? Do you look into what you're what's in your shots when you have your flu shots? No, you may have your very first one, but you don't now. So we're going to become much more lax at the time, and there's going to be much more control. All it takes is one good crisis. We are in a potential crisis that, well, according to the powers that be in the economic community, this is the crisis. It's just a matter of when it comes again. Well, so you've got the idea. We're going to have a one-world government, and we're going to have a one-world leader called the Antichrist. Now, when is this government going to start? Is it going to start before the Antichrist is revealed? It could. It could start, and they could have a president in there for a while, and he might not be the Antichrist. He might be the second or third president that comes into the global government. So this glo global government could start any time. We just know it will be in existence by the time the Antichrist takes over as the leader. Okay, let's look at the, let's get to Revelation 13 now because we're going to look at the second beast or another beast, it says, in Revelation 13. And here it starts in, let me get my paper. Uh, okay, it's in verse 11. In verse 11 of Revelation 13, and it says, And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. Now, what's the earth? The seas are the multitudes of Gentiles. So some people think the earth is a Jew. However, I don't see a Jewish religious leader being able to lead a global, a global uh, Christian or er, gro a global religious entity. So I'm not sure what that means about the earth. But it says he's coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. Well, that's a great description of him. So when you think of a lamb, what do you think of? Soft and fluffy. You think of Jesus, who is loving and caring of people. So he looks like maybe he's Jesus. Maybe because he's loving and kind. But he speaks as a dragon. Big difference. Now, um, I have seen a particular religious leader, you know, on, on TV sometime. I don't remember when it was. And I'm not going to tell you who it was. But he's so soft and loving and kind. And he was walking through this crowd. And somebody took their baby like this to let him kiss the baby. And he went, ah, da, ah, and back like this. And I thought, whoa, you talk about black and white on that one. I mean, he's loving and kind, and then he's got the idea of a, of a dragon. And because, I mean, I may not like it if somebody sticks a baby out there for me to kiss. They shouldn't stick it in his face, but stick it out there. I may not like that, but I wouldn't get all nasty and snarly and stuff. I'd just go, ooh, you know, like this. So I, that's my picture of a lamb, of a lamb and a dragon says in verse 12, and he exercised all authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and all who dwell in it do what? Worship, Worship the first beast. Worship the Antichrist whose fatal wound was healed. And he performs great signs. By the way, I will tell you that he's called the other beast here, but we'll see him later in chapter 16 and 19 and, um, and see how he's called the false prophet there. So that tells us that he's a religious leader, but he's a false religious leader because his name isn't just a beast. He's the false prophet. It says in verse 13, and he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven and to the earth in the presence of the men. Mm, have we seen other people who could make these things happen in our study of Revelation? Who? The two witnesses. The two witnesses. The two witnesses of God were able to do these miraculous things. And now we see this false prophet 
performing miracles also. Verse 14, and he d- does what? Deceives. Deceives. Deception. I cannot tell you how much deception is going to be in this time period. Deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast. So who gave him the ability to do the signs? Satan. Satan. Either Satan or the beast or both. Mm -hmm. That's where he gets his power. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who has the wound of the sword and has come to life. Now this is really interesting because when the Gentiles took over the land of Israel for the first time, it was under Nebuchadnezzar, that king that we read the story about in Daniel chapter 2. So when, they take o- when the Gentiles took over the land of Israel, he had a statue built to himself and made people worship that statue. And now as we come to the end of time, we see another statue being made and people are forced to worship the statue. It says, uh, by the way, s- several times in here it says those who dwell on the earth. These are earth dwellers that we're talking about here that are going to be intimidated. These are the, I believe, unbelievers because the believers will be too strong, to, even though it'll be tough, be too strong to follow and worship the beast. Verse 50, uh, did I finish? Um, Perform, uh, telling to make an image of the beast who is wounded and has come to life. Verse 15. And there was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast might even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Wow. How can he do that? How can he make an image come to life? Have you ever been to Disneyland? Uh, Disneyland. Uh, not, I don't know about Disney World, but they have a haunted house there. And it amazed me because the first time I ever went there, which was for 50 years ago, long time, uh, there was a, there's, you go through the haunted house and there's this little, there are these apparitions talking to you in the haunted house. And when I saw that, I thought, oh, they could do that. And nowadays it's even easier because just a few years ago, President Erdogan from Turkey did a hologram presentation in front of other people. And yet he was in Turkey and they were in their city. And I saw a woman recently who displayed what they could do, but she did a presentation away from where she was days before in the same outfit and came and did this and they show her speaking in a different language because she's in a different country. She spoke the words in her environment, but she wore the same clothes and she's standing in this thing and she holds this hologram that then she goes and it becomes a full-size her, looks exactly like her, and she's speaking a different language. We have the technology now to do something like this. So you get the idea of what's going to happen here? A one world religious system. Okay, well, what I have heard is the possibility now, nobody ever thought about this before, I think, it could be an AI. The beast could be an AI. The beast could be a demon that comes up out of the abyss with Satan and is empowered by Satan, or it could be a human that's indwelled by Satan. So it, if the Antichrist is referred to as it, it could be any of those above. We will, I think, in this world, think he's human, but it could definitely be an it. So we have, now let's look at this global religious system, and then we'll close for the night. In uh, Revelation 17, uh, this is really hard to understand, and I'm not going to try and explain it to you. Uh, So let me just walk through it, because you need to see the religious system in Revelation 17, verses 1 through 6. It says, One of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. We learn later in this passage that the many waters are the kingdoms of the world. Or the, uh, the Gentile nations, the nations. Um, it says, Sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth commit acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. Well, with immorality, you think of some kind of a, a sexual or religious thing. When you think of Israel, when they turned away from God, it was oftentimes sexual, but the fact of the matter is, immorality was related to their turning away from God, to their sin of departing from Him. Verse 3. 
And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Hmm, we've seen this beast. A bla- full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. Ah, it's describing the Antichrist. See, he's sitting on this, and he represents the world kingdom. So here's this religious system, the scarlet, uh, she's writing the scarlet beast, but here's this woman called Mystery Babylon, or Babylon the Great. And she's a religious system, and she's riding right along with the political system. Now, if we look at Islam, Islam is a religion, and it's a political system. It's all in one. Quite frankly, you look at the Catholic Church, it's an autonomous country. It has lots of power, of a political power and a church. So this is not unusual. You see these two powers together. Verse 4, And the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and the unclean things of her immorality. You get the idea of how corrupt she is spiritually? And upon her head a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abomination of the earth. The mother of harlots. Mystery Babylon. Whenever you see the word mystery, mysterion in the Greek, it's a mystery. (laughs) We can't fully understand it until it happens. Christ was a mystery. What he, the church was a mystery. It's called a mystery in scripture. So it, uh, it might be a little difficult to understand it until it happens, but we know clearly, well, we know somewhat clearly from this passage that she is a religious system. Verse six, and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered greatly and not surprising. Now here are some coins and some, a stamp and a statue of the European Union. Remember, the European Union may well represent the last world power. When they became the world, the European Union, the coin has a woman riding a beast. The stamp has a woman riding the beast. The statue outside their headquarters in Brussels has a woman riding the beast. Did they know what they were doing when they used this symbolism? I don't think it was an accident. Somebody knew when they made that, the symbolism of this, what will eventually be the one world government. So we have a coalition here of the religious and the the secular. It tells us over at the end of verse 17, chapter 17, I didn't put it here, so I'll read it to you. Uh, It says in verse 16 of Revelation 17, and the ten horns which you saw in the beast, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up. For God has put it in their heart to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast and the words of God should be fulfilled. So the Antichrist and his kingdom are going to turn away from the religious system. Once they get the political power and the religious power, they will then turn away from the religious system. Now, if this isn't tough enough, verse 18 of Revelation 17 says, And the woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Oh, boy. So she's a religious system and she's a city. How do you understand that? It's tough. Chapter 18, 17 and 18 are two of the hardest to understand right now. Maybe we'll see it as time gets going, but they're the hardest to understand right now. Okay, let me give you a couple last thoughts here. Pope Francis is, I'm not saying that the Catholic Church is the final religious system, but if you consider that the Catholic Church has 1.2 billion people in it, the other Christian churches' denominations have 1.2 billion in them, The Muslims are 1.8 billion, and then you have uh, Hindu and Buddhists following thereafter. But you see, this is a very powerful system, and right now, Pope Francis is very much a secular leader as much as he is a religious leader. He believes a lot of the stuff that's happening right now that's building into the one world government, as well as the sustainable development. So he said in the video, all of the major religions are different paths to the same God. The Bible doesn't say that. Pope Francis has been quoted as saying, we all believe in the same God, there's no hell, and Jesus was uh, 
It says he was not a man. That means he was not God. When he was man, he was not God. When he was here on this earth, he was not God. I, I misquoted that. But that's what he's been quoted as saying in a magazine, um, La Republic magazine. In 2013, in his encyclical, Pope Francis called for the gradual creation of a world political authority. Oh, why would a religious person call for a political authority? With broad power to regulate financial markets and rein in the inequities and distortions of capitalistic development. A supernatural authority, it said, is needed to place the common good at the center of international economic activity. Common good, folks. We need to have the vaccine for the common good. We need to do this for the common good. The common good is all about socialistic governmental control. That's what it is. Because which of us doesn't want to help our fellow man? That's a Christian thing to do. So when we talk about the common good, or when they do, it's buying us in, it's manipulating us into supporting what they say is the common good. But anyway, in this case, that, that's aside from the, what the Pope said. On May 14, 2020, Pope Francis was to have hosted an event called Reinventing the Global Education Alliance. Now, wait a minute. Now you got the political alliance, and you have the education alliance, and you have the financial alliance he's talking about there. And the alliance that generates peace, justice, and hospitality among all peoples of the human family, as well as dialogue between religions. So you've got the religions thrown in there, too. And finally, the economics, economy of Francis supports concerns of the environment, which urgently demands a sound economy and a sustainable development, tag word from the United Nations, that can heal its wounds and assure a worthy future. So you see, I'm not saying that Fra Pope Francis is the false prophet or the Catholic Church is the false religious system. What I'm saying is, <coughs> you can see how it can happen because this religious system has put its fingers in all kinds of political activities. Okay, we will end there tonight because you have the idea of the global government, the Antichrist, the global government that's going to come up, and the false religious system. No wonder that if it's possible, even the elect would be deceived. Because everyone from every important aspect is going to be filling you full of deception, not you, but the world, full of deception and false information to try and deceive them. And then when we get to the mark of the beast next week, we're going to find out about how they're manipulating this on our financial system and our economic system. So we're already seeing evangelical pastors embracing the Pope as our pastor. And a lot of people do respect him. He's a religious leader. But you see how this can happen. This is what's in the future. But it's not just in the future. We're seeing it happen today. I could give you example after example, as she just did, of how the religions are starting to coalesce together in an ecumenical system. And we already see how the governments are. And you're going to be blown away when you see next week how the economies are. We will be in a one world system. Well, we already are. We have the World Health Organization. We have the International Monetary Fund. We already have, we have global stock markets. Our stock markets are maybe our country, but we depend on each other. We have global trade. We're already one world. We just don't have the structure yet. It's only a matter of time. Father God, we are so glad you let us see the future. More importantly, we're glad you're in control of it. It's so great tonight to see that you don't give up on people until they completely give up on you. And only then will you send them a deluding influence. Father, no wonder people are believing such falsehoods that make, they have no logic to what we're going through right now. I mean, we're turned upside down. The good is called evil and the evil is called good as we watch what's happening right now. And we're not even in this tribulation period. So I can't imagine how much worse it's going to get. Father, open our eyes to you to the truth, because only when we know the truth can that truth set us free and help us discern the false. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining Living Word Ministries. Living Word Ministries is a viewer-supported program. Please visit www.livingwordministry.org for more Bible studies and information. And please join us again for Living Word Ministries.